So we're going to get started. I'm going to be talking today about fucking with algorithms. I know that most of you guys probably think of algorithms in terms of, I need to set something up to solve a problem. My job and my hobby is to fuck with the things that you make, and there's very good reasons for that. So we're going to dive into that. Why is fucking with algorithms a uniquely human hobby? Well, let's look at it from the start. What is an algorithm? An algorithm in itself is just a series of steps that you will undertake to make a decision or solve a problem. It should be effective, it should be well-defined, and it should be finite. So it should give you a solution. Now, with that in mind, what is an algorithm to me? Well, it could be my recipe for making pancakes. That's an algorithm too. And most people have a tendency to make them way more complicated than they should be. Algorithms are very, very pervasive in our everyday lives. Why? Because they make things easier. I don't have the luxury or the brain power to wonder if taking left or right is going to be faster. However, Google Maps will tell me. So I rely on algorithms to make my life easier. And that's pretty great. The problem is that they tend to be scary. Why? Well, when you think about it, it's a more objective way of solving a problem. It brings rigor to the human decision-making process. So it should be awesome. Except that for some reason, as humans, we don't like awesome. We don't like easy. We want to make things complicated. We like to game the system. And gaming the system is all about making sure that you play with the rules in place in a way that will bring the outcomes you want, not the ones that the system wants. And what I find deeply, deeply ironic is that this expression didn't exist for a very long time. I mean, the first time we referred to an algorithm as human beings was 1,600 years before Christ. And somehow it took until 1975 to coin the term that basically explains what we do every day, which is to fuck with the rules. And what's even better for me is that it was coined by engineers in the 70s in Las Vegas, because of course, that makes a lot of sense. So why am I talking about fucking with algorithms? Because there's a reason why we do it. There's actually multiple reasons. First of all, because it's fun. I actually like to say, I beat the system, I'm number one. There's also another reason, because sometimes they suck, because sometimes I don't agree with the way things are done and I'm not the only one. And there's a third reason, because we can gain from it. There's actually big money to be made from gaming the system and making sure that algorithms that have been put into place to make sure that people don't cheat and don't turn up first, well, if we mess with them, we can end up number one and make a lot of money. So let's dive into a few examples. Have you ever heard the term Google bombing? It's actually a real term in the dictionary. It's when a lot of people get together to decide what the results should be in Google. And the most famous ones, and we're not gonna go into details, are pretty horrible. If you're wondering what kind of car Jesus drives, there's an answer to that because they decided so. The most famous one for me is the first one in the early 2000s. If you typed more evil than Satan himself, you had this sexy man show up. It was Microsoft.com. Not because, you know, the search algorithm decided it should be. It's because humans decided to feed the machine and say, actually, we think it's Microsoft. So it can get very, very fun. The problem is that we see it negatively. There's a difference between working the system and gaming the system. When you're working with the system, you're being rewarded because it's seen as positive, because you are working within a system, so you respect the rules to maximize the outcomes. But when you're gaming the system, it, it implies that you're gaming, gaining an unfair advantage to bring about an outcome for which the system was never intended, AKA, you actually didn't deserve the outcome. And that's a big fucking problem for me. Why? Because most of the algorithms that we use in our everyday lives are actually owned by people, and in effect, they are giant black boxes. Nobody ever tells me anything about this. I actually have to test them out to know how they play about. And that's not fair. Why? 
Because you may not realize it, but code, well, it takes your biases. It takes your perspective. It takes all the stereotypes that you have in your mind. Which means what? It means that the outcomes that I should have never engineered myself by gaming the system, well, you decided unconsciously that I never deserve them. And that's not okay for me. And this is why it became such a human hobby for me. Except that, like I said, I'm not the only one. And it's causing huge issues. And when I started thinking about this, the whole Trump fiasco was not even happening. But now you see it even more. I mean, algorithms are so pervasive that now you can see them as a subtle form of social control. So you have to be very, very careful when you think about these things because they impact our everyday lives and we don't even notice it. That's the whole point of them being subtle. So I'd like to take a lighter look at this. How do people gain the system? Just for the record, I've been happily married for 10 years, so Tinder is not my thing, but I admire people who play with Tinder. Why? Because it's based on the ELO algorithm. The ELO algorithm, well, they used a modified version of what World of Warcraft people are using. And if you read this properly, you will see that the whole system is based on evaluating individual players according to the assumed skills they have against other players. So what I'm hearing is, I'm never going to be good enough for me. I actually have to compete with other people to get more visibility and more dates. Well, you know what? That's an open invitation for me to mess with the system because I don't agree with it. I don't want to be evaluated according to other people for something that has to do with emotions, that has to do with human relationships. And I'm not the only one. Quite a few people have had this and managed to get 10,000 dates in under a week. There's other ways we can play around with it, and this is very, very powerful for common people that use the internet. Whenever you get to mess with something that you see as highly complex by typing in a few words, it makes you feel like a champion, and it should. This guy managed to basically annoy everybody on Facebook, well, everybody that was his friends, because he created a post that seems to the algorithm like it's a very important post, that something huge in his life happened. And it turns out that it got enough momentum that people kept seeing this post for weeks on end, and it kept showing up and showing up, and people were telling him, yeah, it's still number one, could you please make it stop? I'm tired of seeing your news that aren't news. But he was very proud because he's basically said, I took me, you know, what? Five sentences to reverse engineer this whole entire thing. Woohoo, I'm the best. Well, <clears throat> it can be annoying, but it also highlights a lot of things because you get to see what happened with fake news. He did it for fun. Other people do it for profit, and you don't know who they are, but somehow the news seems a bit believable because, you know, it keeps showing up, so it must be important. So, with that in mind, you should think about issues with algorithms. I said that it's a black box, and it is. But what happens is we are convinced that this, these algorithms, they're so present in our lives that they're supposed to make it easier. They're supposed to help us. The problem is, most of the time, when these things are put in place, especially when they're corporate black box boxes, well, they're not helping you. They're helping other people or other corporations. For Facebook, and I should know because originally I work in marketing, technical marketing. So I know that Facebook is helping you because they want to gain more data about you to sell you off to advertisers. And it's true. And that's the concept of corrupt personalization. It's the idea that an algorithm is supposed to help you out, but it actually doesn't. It serves another master. And it's always at your expense. It's never a win-win situation. No matter how much, you know, I could do an entire talk about how it's a win-win situation. I'm in marketing after all, but it's not the case. So let's talk about other people that have messed with Facebook. One of my favorite ones, and I highly recommend you read this up because the entire story is magnificent. This guy decided to troll his roommate. His roommate was a professional sword swallower that could not swallow aspirins. So I keep telling you that we're doing things professionally and we're keeping information away and, you know, personally identifiable information is, is not attainable on Facebook and it's okay and we're doing this cleanly. No, no. This guy was able to take his roommate and segment the audience to the point where there's an audience of one person, which was the roommate. And then he proceeded to stalk 
the guy for weeks on end by creating highly personalized ads that would go, are you a professional sword swallower? And do you have difficulty swallowing aspirin? Isn't that ironic? And it got to the point where the roommate got so paranoid because he thought that his whole entire house was bugged. And he started looking under the phone, under the lights, until the marketing guy told him, no, you, made a, you had a prank on me. That was my way of pranking you. I've been stalking you for weeks. And it can get really, really terrifying. So of course, um, Facebook then ran away and went, oh my goodness, we will fix this. Great, that's awesome. Except that it doesn't really work out because we still get to mess around with the system. I promise you that there's different ways we can access information from people on different platforms. And the problem with that is algorithms are biased. Algorithms will target specific people while making other people invisible. So no matter how much you wish you would get this outcome, you wish, you know, you will do everything right. And somehow you never make it. You never get to be number one. You're never deemed the best. And you don't realize that it doesn't matter how much you follow the rules that have been set into place. A, you don't even know what the rules are because it's a black box. Nobody's telling you. B, everybody's telling you, trust the system. We built it in a way that's fair. And C, you know something is wrong. You want to game it, you want to win, but then you keep being told it's not ethical. That is something that I think about a lot. And whenever different things show up online, I will try to optimize them and see what happens. So I have tortured quite a few people myself, um, especially on YouTube, because I don't know if you've noticed, when you search things on YouTube, there's always hot girls in bikinis in the video previews, even if it's for a zucchini recipe. I don't understand why. Well, there's a reason why. It's because people click on it. So what I would do is send emails going, oh, um, I have a very, very important document I need you to see. And it was actually Finnish hardcore love goth metal or something awful. Very creative, though. And so what would happen is if you get the person to click repeatedly on different links of insane videos, there's a his history feature in YouTube. So guess what? They would keep receiving more and more insane recommendations showing up. And they would tell me, please stop messing with my history. I'm tired of YouTube telling me I should watch these things. And well, my friend is still my friend, but um, she's very careful about what she clicks now. So there's different ways we get to enjoy it. It can be fun. It can be for profit as well. I'm not going to lie. My specialty is, well, optimizing search engines. So for example, LinkedIn has a search algorithm. Guess what? I come out a lot. I mean, did you know I'm specialized in UX and JavaScript? And I also do content and I will do design. I didn't know that myself until I started messing with it. And I keep popping up in recruiter searches. So I get harassed a lot. But it was fun while I did it because I figured out it could be number one, even though I absolutely suck at half of these things. But it doesn't matter. I still get the offers. So there's a few companies that have decided to do something else, something different, using algorithms to actually help people. Well, there's quite a few, but the one I like the most because it's a success story to me is skip lagged. You've probably never heard of them, but they're an amazing way to travel if you are leaving with a backpack. Why? Well, these guys have tapped into algorithms that are used by um, different airlines and they will find a way. For example, I live in Canada. If I want to fly from Cancun, Mexico, to Montreal, which is the French side of Canada, let's say it will cost me $500. If I say I want to fly to Toronto with a stop in Montreal, so changing planes, then it's 300. But why? I mean, I don't understand. You're stopping my city. You're supposed to be cheaper, but you're not. Well, I don't necessarily agree with these rules and skip lagged didn't agree either. So they made a service available for everybody where you can actually find hidden routes. You need to get from point A to point B for the cheaper price. You can with them. They will tell you, hey, the airline will make a stop over here. You just need to get off. That's it. And you'll save money. Except that the airlines didn't enjoy this, even though it was ruled, after all, perfectly legal. So they sued the guy. They sued this really young New Yorker going, we don't agree with you, and we're going to put millions to put you out of business. And the business itself doesn't really make money. It's the concept of helping people. And the judge ruled against 
the airlines on a technicality. But what's really scary to me is that it was a legal technicality. It was not an ethical issue. It was not a question of who's right, who's wrong, or what should we do, or should the airlines improve their algorithms. It was just the, the way it was done was, oh, there's a legal technicality in New York, so we are going to throw this out. So he's safe for now, but we don't know for how long. And I would like to end on a note, because this has been a lightning talk. I just wanted to get you thinking about all this. To be is to be perceived. And this is very, very true when you think about it. Because you may not realize that a lot of things are going on in the world simply because, guess what? Facebook's news algorithm doesn't think it's that relevant. Or maybe because it's Google News that doesn't think it's that relevant. Or you know what? Maybe there was a promoted Twitter hashtag that was more important than the other news that were passing around. So we create our own echo chambers and we end up just ignoring things because they don't show up. They're not perceived. So the next time you have to optimize an algorithm, I know that you're not going to be on my side of things, but think about it and think, hey, is the math wrong? Does that make sense? Am I doing this right? Validate with someone else, just in case. Leave the echo chamber. And that's about it. Thank you very much. <laughs>